This famous graphic by Charles Joseph Minard shows in red the path and dwindling numbers of the French army as they struggle towards the Russian capital. When they reach Moscow, the army has dwindled to only 100,000 men. As the army retreated, the temperature dropped. And as the temperature dropped, so did his numbers. 40,000, 20,000, 10,000. The French army was ill-equipped for the Russian winter and they'd run out of food. As you will see in this World War II film, feeding the troops is a U.S. military priority. Army food is no longer a matter of beans and guesswork. Since the last war, nutrition has become a science, and our Army Quartermaster Corps uses that science in planning Army meals. Food correctly used means fighting strength for our soldiers and better health for civilians. Scientists at food plants, at universities, and at the Quartermaster Corps' own subsistence laboratories in Chicago, study food for energy. The food weapons of our enemies are investigated. The Japanese are supposed to produce great fighting energy out of a handful of rice. This is the amount of rice one of our soldiers would have to eat to approach the energy in his own ration. The Nazis are supposed to have a Superman vitamin pill. The pill story is checked by Dr. Ansel Keys and his staff at the University of Minnesota. Vitamins and pills do not help pull weight, but vitamins do help the body use food. Only after eating actual food can a soldier pull more weight or push a bayonet harder. To discover what foods contain the right vitamins for fighting in various parts of the world, experiments are conducted in rooms where any climate can be imitated. Holy smoke, they got us in the Sahara Desert. In this heat, different foods are tried. What's lost in perspiration is measured. The answer to the vitamin question is not pills, but good food in plenty of variety, according to Dr. Keyes. If vitamins were missing from his food, a soldier might have to take concentrated vitamins. If he had vitamins but no food, he would still starve. The best way, naturally, is to supply vitamins in the food. It is for this reason that the army uses only vitamin-enriched flour in its bread. Smells good, huh? If you lose your oven, take a couple of barrels, cover them with clay, and bake your bread. The Quartermaster Corps believes in supplying our men everywhere with an abundant variety of fresh food of the kind they like, cooked the way they like it. In this country, the job is comparatively simple. All army cooks follow a standard menu prepared by nutritionists in Washington. Vegetables and fruits, milk and eggs, are centrally purchased in vast quantities by army officers and civilian experts. The pick of the country's fresh meat is bought, 
nearly a pound a day per soldier. The job of supply gets more difficult as a million men go overseas, for the Quartermaster Corps faces the problem of shipping space. So meat is deboned, saving 60% in bulk. Still more space is saved through dehydration. A greater variety of food can now be shipped in this form. Only the water in them is removed to be replaced before cooking. Thus one ship can carry the load of 10. For dehydration, every egg is examined. The yolks are separated from the whites and put through a dryer. Our soldiers on the other side of the world will be provided with breakfast omelets made of this pure yolk powder. Vegetables, such as beets, go through a new process which preserves color, taste, and vitamin content. While these amazing developments in food processing are now used principally for the army, millions of civilians will be benefited after the war. For in the future, no household need be without vitamin-rich vegetables and fruits at any time. Dehydrated food is easy to keep. The Quartermaster Corps Laboratory has established this in exhaustive tests. Only water need be added. When cooked, it is often impossible to detect a difference in taste, and constant tests show practically no difference in vitamin content between the dehydrated and the untreated product. When a soldier is out in the field and away from camp cooks, he must carry his own ration. Pre-cooked meats for emergency rations were developed in the Army laboratory for this purpose. Here, too, emphasis is put on taste as well as on the food value of the ration which consists of a can of meat for each meal and a second unit containing concentrated soup, hardtack, coffee powder, and candy. Total weight, three and a half pounds for three square meals a day. But specialized troops in mobile warfare need a still more compact ration. So the Army has developed the now famous K ration, the completely streamlined meal. Originally designed for paratroops, K proved ideal for tank busters, commandos, and all isolated units. Each package contains a balanced vitamin-rich meal. A day's ration weighs about two pounds. K was developed under Colonel Rowland A. Isker. The object of the K ration is to provide the soldier with food under emergency. This ration, with its variations, is therefore adapted to all climatic conditions, from the tropics to the frigid zone. Each item in K had to be super nutritious, but also appetizing. So each item was tested by Colonel Iska's guinea pig lunch club. Several recipes, for instance, were tried in picking a soybean biscuit. This biscuit seems to meet specifications. Pretty tasty biscuit. You bake this biscuit on existing equipment. With few adjustments. How much soy is there in these? About one part in seven. Good eating. Thus we find ways to use such highly nourishing staples as the soybean, which is easily produced in great plenty. The energies in this and other hitherto inefficiently used foods are unlocked for the world by chemists such as Dr. Julian of Illinois, a famous soy expert. Soy flour strengthens wheat flour, eggs, lard in the K-ration breakfast biscuit. With this and other items in K, we are in the possession of new foods, new methods of preparation, which make mankind independent of distance and climate. These war foods are also bulwarks against famine and catastrophe. To produce them, we have a new industry. When the Army asked its suppliers to build this packaged food industry overnight, they didn't know they were getting K ready for Africa. A chewing gum company flung together a package assembly line out of bicycle chain. This company intends to make K a packaged meal business when peace comes. Millions of K rations. Each container has a tin of meat or cheese, the soy and other biscuits, a concentrated chocolate bar, fruit bar or dextrose candies, coffee, lemon or soup powder, instantly soluble in cold or hot water, cigarettes, 
and that American nerve tonic, chewing gum. And this amazing package requires no strategic material. Tests, such as the bubble test, sometimes uncover imperfections. For K cartons must be air and watertight, gas-proof and seaworthy. With science at his service and the greatest food producing country in the world backing him up, the American soldier, no matter where he may be, in the jungle, in the Arctic, in the desert, or in his home camp, can rightly consider himself the best fed soldier in the world. And in the future, the war-born knowledge that has made him so, when spread over the world, can guarantee that no one on earth need suffer from malnutrition or from hunger. Thank you again for tuning in to What Do You Think? I'm your host, Colin Sandy. Today we're going to talk about the U.S. Army. It was said by French General Napoleon Bonaparte that an army runs on its stomach, and the U.S. Army is no different. It's been a far cry from the K rations of oatmeal in World War I, or the beans in France of World War II, or even the more recent ready-to-eat meals, or MREs. Today we're going to talk to Jacqueline Tellisford, who's going to tell us a little more about how food is handled for the U.S. Army. Welcome, Jackie. Thank you, Colin. So, Jackie, tell me what you do for the U.S. Army. I am a food safety officer for the United States Army. And what are your responsibilities? Well, my responsibilities are the inspections of all different kinds of food, whether it be MREs, or rations or contracts for the uh, government. And how does, how does what you do differ from what's done on the civilian side that the uh, USDA or the FDA does? As a matter of fact, it's very similar. But my focus is particularly and specific to the uh, military. But it's very much similar. We do uh, basic uh, food inspections and also uh, lab samplings of various different foods for the uh, troops. Now, uh, what's your job title? Well, my job title is um, food safety officer. I'm under the umbrella of the medical command and specifically the veterinary services for the military. Now, do you have to be of a certain rank to to be a food service officer? Yes, all food uh, safety officers are warrant officers. And the rank is from a warrant officer one to a warrant officer five. Now, the you said you, you inspect food. Uh, is all the food that the U.S. Army eats from the from United States sources, or are they all American? Oh, not at all. Uh, foods are import, imported from all different countries including China. Well, you know, it's interesting that you'd raise China. We've had problems with melanin and the baby formula, um, tainted toothpaste and other things in the civilian food supply. Um, how is that handled in the military food supply? What's done there? Well, it's handled uh, the same way as it's handled in the, in the civilian world. Uh, the foods that we receive also are similar to the food received by, um, civili by the civilians. Um, and the foods, when any All Food Act, that's what it's called, any All Food Act uh, comes down from the FDA, we are required to inspect all the foods and place foods on medical hold until some type of uh, lab results come up, uh, is determined whether the food can be uh, fit for human consumption. Now, in peacetime and in time of war, do you have exactly the same, exactly the same procedures? In in um, time of war, yes, it's it's kind of heightened. It depends on the location also, where you're located. If you are in Iraq, of course, the food will be um, more guarded, so to speak, than if it's over here in the United States. So yes, it's it's heightened. Now, have you always done the same job in the U.S. Army? I've always done the same job, and it, I've done the, the same job for the past 11 years. Wow. That's a pretty long time. Are you looking to retire soon? 
Well, no, retirement no. <laughs> is not anytime soon, but um, it, it has been a long time, and um, it has given me a lot of experience and information that is necessary for the protection of the welfare of the troops. And how did you get interested in your job? Because it sounds pretty, pretty interesting. Um, my job, uh, my background is in uh, biology and chemistry, and I've always been interested um, on the medical in, in the medical field. And when I joined the military, I joined with the intent of you know doing something for the the, the troops, doing something that's different and unique. And I think that food inspection is something that you know I enjoy, and it's it's different. It, it's helping the troops. And that's what I enjoy. Now, where are you based? I am based out of uh, uh, Connecticut. That is the Groton, New London subbase. It's um, a Navy base. And are all the food safety officers based there, or are they distributed amongst the U.S.? Oh, they are distributed throughout the uh, the world. Oh. Mm -hmm. And just about how many are there of you? Right now, I believe there are 71 of us. Wow, for in, the entire army? For, in, yes, the entire army. There are 71 food safety officers. Wow, so that's, that's a pretty big responsibility because what, what do you have, like 2 million or so um, enlisted people in the army? Approximately. But um, yes, we, we are the officers, the food safety officers, but beneath us are also other food inspectors. I see. Yes, so we... we um, we handle the ultimate decisions in food make making, but the soldiers are the ones who go out and conduct ins um, inspections, and there are many, many um, food inspectors. We leave you with another interesting video from the War Department Archives. Until next time. where millions are starving, America has become the breadbasket as well as the arsenal of democracy. Our farmlands and ranges must produce more food than ever before to supply our own needs and to help our fighting allies. In spite of record-breaking farm production, food requirements are mounting even faster, for American food is being used to defeat the Axis and shorten the war. Americans not in the armed forces will get less of the common foods to which they are accustomed. But by rationing, by sharing what we have, and by using our food supply wisely, our nation at war can still support a healthy, active people. Today, in the great human laboratory of England, the principles of nutrition are being conclusively proven. The subjects of this great wartime experiment in food are not white mice or guinea pigs, but human beings fighting for their lives. The average English family has learned the value of food through years of wartime scarcity. Cheese and eggs have been rationed, and the supply of butter is limited to two ounces a week. But the English have learned to substitute. Vitamin preparations developed in the laboratory are added to some foods, such as margarine, to enrich the vitamin content. Foods such as the English wheatmeal loaf, Dried peas, beans, and cereals have been recognized as nerve conditioners at a time when iron nerves are needed most. Vitamin B foods supply physical energy not only for those in combat duties, but also for English industrial workers who are turning out the weapons of war with the enemy only 20 miles away. Desk workers also under strain need energy food too. Vitamin D foods such as margarine, Herring and sardines are widely used by adults in England. Cod liver oil and milk are distributed in special rations for children only. Imported fruits and vegetables are seldom seen in English markets, but fresh vegetables are grown in victory gardens everywhere. Old and young alike are mobilized for the job so that the home production of food in Britain has almost doubled. Since the outbreak of the war, six million additional acres of English soil have been put under cultivation.
No patch is too small to start growing. Soldiers, when off duty, tend their own little plots in the shadow of their guns. For them, food is ammunition. A part of the food grown in English Victory Gardens is contributed to community kitchens where balanced, nutritious meals are prepared for all. Because they are learning to use their food supply carefully, many people of Britain are better fed today than ever before. We in the United States have not had our food supplies bombed, burned, or torpedoed. Yet, many Americans are starving not for lack of food, but because of poor eating habits. In this restaurant, patrons could order nutritious food, but too many don't. Same today, miss? Yeah, I guess so. Draw one. Two thinkers. Too many people eat the same kind of foods every day. Eat without pleasure, without variety, as a matter of routine. Quick lunches are the order of the day, and most of these are inadequate. Malnutrition resulting from habitual poor diet saps the strength of American manpower. Inefficiency results. In many cases, production has been slowed down because of layoffs and illness among workers who lack the physical stamina that good food can build. A large proportion of defense workers suffer from unsuspected physical defects associated directly or indirectly with malnutrition. The strain of long, hard hours of work has increased the number of breakdowns. In Army induction centers all over the nation, examining doctors found rejectees starved for the foods to give them the steady nerve, the clear eye, the strength of bone and muscle to fight and win a war. Today, through the work of government and other agencies, millions of American workers are learning the simple facts of proper diet in a nationwide nutrition program. Dr. Thomas Parent, Surgeon General of the United States Public Health Service. Good nutrition and good health are inseparable. No one can do his full part in the war effort without good health. Realizing this fact, government agencies have joined in a national nutrition program and are working with your state, county, and city nutrition committees in their attack on local nutrition problems. You can help just by helping yourself to the right food. Make a real effort to choose a nutritious diet every day. To do this, every citizen should have a down-to-earth working knowledge of modern nutrition. Resolve now to study the daily nutritive requirements recommended by the National Nutrition Program. Study, too, the nutritive values of the many foods now available. You can be well nourished by planning your daily diet carefully, by using wisely the many nutritious, unrationed foods, and by using your full share of ration food. Every one of us must do this, for today we have no choice. War demands that no one waste food. War demands that we use the good foods available to us to build an armor of health. Appetite alone is not a safe guide to good nutrition. To teach the simple facts of good eating, public nutrition classes have been set up in churches, schools, and factories. With wise planning, good meals can be had at low cost. American women are learning how to prepare food with greatest economy, with least waste of vitamin content, and how to substitute the foods we have for the foods we can't get. Above all, experts on food emphasize the importance of balanced diet in which variety is essential. Every American worker should have three square meals each day, including foods such as milk and foods made with milk, eggs or other protein foods, and vitamin B foods such as cereal and whole wheat or enriched white bread. A good breakfast is important, but on the job, the worker's lunch pail must supply the necessary energy for the rest of the working day. Sandwiches of meat or peanut butter can be made more appetizing if fresh lettuce is included. Fresh fruits are valuable additions to the worker's noonday meal. In the evening, 
Chicken, fish, liver, or sweetbreads are excellent main dishes with green leafy salad and cooked vegetables such as peas or carrots. Milk, fruit, and vegetables are basic protective foods for Americans working longer, harder hours in offices and factories. To keep up health and morale, many war plants have set up central food kitchens to prepare appetizing, nutritious meals for the men who build the ships and make the guns. Whole wheat and enriched white bread are used in sandwiches with cheese, peanut butter, and different kinds of meat. The average worker needs twice as much green vegetables and fruits as he now consumes. So on the menu of most kitchens are vegetables such as carrots, spinach, cauliflower, and lima beans, and other inexpensive and often overlooked dishes such as squash, parsnips, and hot soups and stews rich in many food essentials. Good food can increase the worker's efficiency on the job, reduce accidents, weight, and absenteeism due to inadequate diet. The men of our armed forces eat one-fourth more food than they did in civilian life. And in the same way, workers transferring to war jobs from less strenuous work need better food and more of it. At work, or at home, in restaurants and cafeterias. In their selection of food, American workers choose the way to good or to poor health, build or undermine the strength of our nation. Eventual victory in this war may depend on what we eat. And given the national will to do it, we can build here in America a tougher, more vigorous nation, a nation with better morale, and greater strength of mind than the world has ever known. Food can build a new America.